Hello, I'm Ron Suchecki from Hoot Systems of Lake Charles, Louisiana, and today we're at a, an aerobic treatment system. It is a 600 gallon per day ATU that has both a treatment component and a drip dispersal component. Today we're going to be doing service on the Hoot system. The water or the waste comes from the house through the four inch line here where we have a clean out cap and the power comes from the house to the system and is supplied via a 50 amp service disconnect. As you approach the system to service, you're going to want to make sure that all of the risers, access points to the system are intact and, have, uh, and, are, and are secure. You're also going to want to op observe all the other features of the treatment system. One thing that we want to also take in is a, is a good breath and make sure that we don't have any uh, noticeable odors associated with the system. Uh, in this case, we find that the riser over the pretreatment, the aeration unit and clarifier, and the pump tank seem to be intact, and that we uh, have the control panel in a working, normal condition. Part of any technician's service kit should be a charged up cordless uh, drill or screwdriver to gain access to the tank. We're going we're gonna to remove the lids starting with the pretreatment side of the system. Within this single access riser on the system, we can observe the conditions of three separate chambers of the system. We have the pretreatment tank in the front, which is also like a septic tank where solids settle out, floatables come to the top. It transfers over into the aeration chamber, which you can see beneath the airline that agitation and roll, and the odorless effluent rises up to the left of that in the clear quiescent clarifier. The white pipe that you see coming into the system supplies the aeration to the treatment system. At the end of the white pipe, down at the bottom of the tank, we have four fine air diffusers. You can notice the agitation coming up from one of those fine air diffusers. We've also included a clean out cap where we can do a stone flush on the system. A stone flush is used not very often, but when a system is out of service uh, for a long period of time, uh, or if a house has extremely hard water, we may have to do a treatment to the diffusers to keep them operating properly. From this one access point, we're able to get a sludge judge sample of each of three chambers of the system. The first one we will do, we will sample is the pretreatment chamber or the septic tank. Okay, our next sample point that we're going to look at is the aeration chamber. And we're going to put that through this four inch hole in the clarifier wall where we have the agitation occurring. I'm going to put that down within this chamber. Be careful, there is a diffuser stone down there that you don't want to damage. We're going to go ahead and then pull that up. And this is a mixed liquor sample on the system. And for the most part, there's very little in this. So uh, we've got some stratification that you can see in here, uh, but the suspended solids or the settleable solids on this uh, is less than 10%. So this system does not need to be pumped for that reason. And the third place that we can sludge judge or sample is in the clarifier or the hopper itself. And we can put that down here until it stops in the bottom and we can sample the stratification of the wastewater through the clarifier. And you can see that we don't really have anything present in the clarifier either. So to review, uh, in the pretreatment chamber, we found approximately 12 to 18 inches of solids at the bottom of the clarifier, which uh, with a chamber of 52 inches would be approximately 25%. In the aeration chamber, we didn't see much noticeable solids, but I indicated that it would probably settle out to be 10 to 15%. And in the, in the clarifier, we didn't find the presence of any solids. So that would indicate to, to me that we have a system that uh, could have either recently been pumped out uh, or is not uh, being maxed out by the occupancy level of the home. 
As a bonus, this system has an additional riser over the clarifier that's going to give us a better view of that uh, for vis visual observation. So we're going to go ahead and unscrew this riser as well. This view gives us a, a good shot of the so top surface of the clarifier. Uh, you can see that we have a nice reflection on the water. It's clean. The four inch pipe there is the, is the transfer pipe where it leaves the clarifier and goes to the pump tank. You can also see the uh, airline going to the other diffusers running around the top of the tank. From the same location where we will get our aeration sample with our sludge judge would also be the same place where we would sample for DO or dissolved oxygen with either a sond, a meter, or using a snap kit. To gain access to the pump tank, we're going to need to remove the lid on the system. We're also going to sample the pump tank to make sure that we don't have any excessive solids carry over to the pump tank. If we have a lot of solid showing up in the pump tank, uh, we may have surge events that, that carry over solids and those can clog the drip filter and the intake of the pump. So we're going to look for that. Okay, we're going to remove the sludge judge and take a look at the column of water. And we can see that we've got two, three, four inches of solids down at the bottom of the tank, followed by about 18 inches of, of clear water. And this is something that we're going to want to watch. When this gets up to about eight inches of solids, you're going to begin to take that into the intake of the pump, which would prematurely clog up the filter uh, and require a service visit. So we're going to want to watch that. And this is something that can be done uh, either pumped out by a pump truck or if it's a very small volume like we're dealing with here, uh, it could actually be pumped back into the headworks or the front of the treatment system. To remove the clip, we're going to push apart the clamp and we can pull this out of the tank. We've disconnected that and we'll use a pair of snips to remove the zip strap that's tying the wires together so we can completely remove the probe for inspection. I'm going to clean off the probe. We've got a little bit of organic residue down here on the low probe um, and on here. But the way the probe works is we've got stainless steel contacts uh, on the bottom. This is the low probe. This is what we call the high probe. And this is the alarm on point. Uh, for now, we're going to clean this off. Inside here is located the blower. This is a, a not a typical box that's, that's provided with the system, but it, it's what's here. Uh, inside here is the blower. We've got a check valve. We also have the power coming to the blower and we've got the air pressure sensor line. On each visit you need to clean the air filter on the system and the air filter is located underneath the cover. We gain access to this through a regular screwdriver, Phillips head screwdriver. Remove the cover. And here's the air filter. And this is, this is dirty and needs to be simply washed out uh, using water under pressure. Don't use any soap or any, any chemicals to clean this out. I'm going to rinse off our air filter just using water under pressure. You can see that came completely clean. Filter can be replaced, but it's not typically re replaced every, but every three to five years when we install a service kit for the blower where the blower can be completely rebuilt out in the field. Also clean out the uh, underside of the lid if there's any dirt or debris inside that. Make sure not to dislodge the gasket and if you do, you just simply reinstall that. And we'll take both this and the filter back over to the blower. We're going to reinstall these back on the blower. Put that on there and the cover and then reinstall the screw. The entire electrical system runs through the control panel. 
the probe, the air blower, the effluent pump are all controlled by the controller. The service provider has the ability to access modes to troubleshoot and diagnose the system's operation. They can all be accessed through this red button here on the front of the control panel. To enter the service modes, we're going to depress the button for 16 seconds. We have five different modes we can access. The first one gives the status on the system. The second forces the pumps on. The third gives us the air back pressure. And the fourth gives us the last four alarms. The fifth mode is used to clear the alarms. When we hear that double chirp, we release the button. And we immediately hold it back down. The system will go through a lamp test and come back on with either a single beep or a series of beeps. We hold it for an additional eight seconds. At the end of the eight seconds, we hear the first beep. And at that point, we release and we're in mode one. Mode one gives the status on the system and tells us the water level in the tank. And this is displayed on the front. We have a red system alarm light to let us know that we're actually in the service modes. We have the green light indicating that we see ambient light and these three bottom lamps that are not lit right now are redefined as the condition of a water level that the probe sees. To verify that the panel sees the correct water condition in the tank, we're going to insert it down into the water column. When it sees water over the low probe, the bottom light will light. When it sees water over the high probe, the middle light will light, and when it sees water over the alarm probe, the third yellow light will light. We're going to exit mode one with the probe indicating water over the low probe, as is shown by the yellow light here at the bottom. To exit the, to exit the mode, you press the button, release, and we hold it immediately back down. This time, we're going to go out to mode two. So we have an eight second delay and we will hear a single chirp to get to mode one. Two chirps is mode two and we release here. This will force the, both the air pump and the water pump on for an inspection. As in each of the modes, it will stay in, in mode one, two, three, and four for a total of 15 minutes before it automatically exits out. During that 15 minutes, we can check the operation of the blower, we can check the operation of the water pump, and as you can hear in the background, it is operating right now, and this is when we would go and inspect our drip field, check our pressure out at the supply and return manifold. While we have the pump running, we're also going to check the pressure out to our field. We've got a supply and a return manifold marked by the S in the R. We're going to check the pressure on each of those. Using a standard or a digital pressure gauge, we can use the Schrader valve that's provided on the air release valve to check the pressure. On the supply, it looks like we're reading approximately 45 PSI. A typical range is going to be between 35 and 45 on the supply. And on the return, we're showing about 40, 42 PSI. We should only see a few pounds of pressure drop across the field, and the return should be at least 25 PSI if the system is not in a field flush. If you have high pressure going out to the field in normal range, but on the return, you have less than 25, you need to look for a break in a line or on a manifold. While we're here, we're going to do a visual observation for any breakouts or areas where you have an intense green or soggy area over the drip field. Finding none and finding a normal pressure on both the supply and the return manifold, it looks like the drip system is doing fine as well. When you're done checking your water pressure, 
you can push the button again to exit mode two and we can then go out to mode three. So we're gonna press and hold. We'll get our double beep to exit. We release the button and then we're gonna hold it right back down again. It comes back on, goes through the lamp test and then there's an eight second delay before we again go past mode one, mode two, and now we're into mode three. In mode three, the control panel gives an audible signal to indicate the back pressure on the treatment system. The system normally operates between 60 and 80 water column inches, which translates into approximately two to three PSI. This is important because if the pr pressure falls below 52 inches, we know that we have a break in the airline to the system or a blower that's failing. If it goes above 100, we're not gonna be delivering the right amount of air to the system. So the range we're looking for typically is between 65 and 80 water column inches. You'll hear a long pause and then we'll hear two, three, four, five, six, short pause, one, two, three, four, five. In this case, we have 65 water column inches present on the blower. To demonstrate a lower pressure, I'll go ahead and remove the airline. The system does an averaging to stabilize the number, so it takes about 20 seconds for it to go down to nothing. And in this case, the reference of nothing, we're hearing a single beep, and that's indicating about one water column inch, which is really nothing left on the system. Now we're indicating that there's zero air left. We're gonna reinstall the airline. And the pressure will come back up on the system. Two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. We're gonna exit this mode by pushing and holding the button down. It will display the current number out one more time and then we'll hear our double beat. We release and we hold the button back down to go into our, to go into mode four and mode four is gonna display the last four alarms on the system. Up to the last four alarms are held in mode four. In this case, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is the most recent alarm, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and before that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've had an eight, and then we've had a seven, and then we've had another eight. And if you look at your table, you'll see that we've had a low air pressure, a high water alarm, and another low air pressure. We exit out of mode four, and we're gonna go out to mode five. When we go out to mode five, we're gonna actually clear those last alarms. So you're gonna indicate those alarms that you found on the system on your service form, and then you're gonna to go, to the, go to the panel out to mode five and clear those alarms so that the next time you come out, you'll be certain that, there's, that those are new alarms since you've been to the system. We're gonna go out this time to mode five. We're gonna go past mode one, two, three, and four. After mode four, there's a long pause, and during that pause, it's kind of an indication to you that uh, you're getting out to mode five, and mode five is where you clear the alarms. So when we get to mode five, we're gonna release the button. And, in mo and this time, it's gonna confirm we wanna do this. So it's giving us a little warning. It says kind of a reminder, have you checked your alarms? If you haven't, you can exit out of the alarm right now to go back and write those down. If we press and hold the button, we're gonna clear them. So if we wanna exit, we're gonna tap the button quickly, but in this case, we wanna clear those alarms. So we're gonna press and hold the button until we hear a short triple beep. We release the button, and this time when the panel comes back on, it'll come on with the lamp test, and there'll be only a single beep at startup.
and that single beep that comes on indicates that there's no alarms registered in memory. Next thing we're going to do is pull the pump and clean the intakes. In this case, the effluent pump is a high head effluent pump that has a motor on the bottom and then the liquid end or the pump stage on top. The center is where the intake is for the pump. So we're going to want to hose off and clean this and also make sure that we don't have any debris and things like a little bit of cut plastic caught up there on the, uh, on the, stage, uh, on the intake of the pump. We're going to hose off the debris that's on the outside of the pump. Down back into the tank. And then we'll pull it up and take a look and see how clean we've gotten it. We can notice here we've got a little bit of plastic from when the system was first installed. It's actually caught on there. It's the same color as this riser. And as you can see, we've completely cleaned the intake screens here or slots on the pump. And it's ready for reinstall. Now we're going to reinstall the pump into the pump tank and attach to the union there on the side of the filter. The next thing we're going to do is remove the filter cartridge and clean that over the trash trap portion of the treatment system. In this case, we have a drip filtration system in front of the drip dispersal system. So from the pump, we come up and through the filter and then out to the field. The wrench is provided with the system and is held on by a nylon cord to the solenoid valve where it says return tank. To remove the cartridge, we put the wrench on and turn it counterclockwise. Okay, once we've loosened the retaining nut on the cartridge, we're going to remove the outside of the cartridge. I've left the filter cartridge in place to show where it is. We're going to carefully remove it from the tank. And you can see the debris that's on the outside of the filter that we now need to clean off. This is a three-dimensional filter. The individual rings have crosses on them, kind of like a poker chip. Some go this way, some go this way. Each chip stacked provides 11 to 13 cross connections there, or narrow points on the filter. So what we're going to do is we're going to clean this filter off, but we're not wanting to just clean the surface itself. We have to clean in between the rings. The water flows from the outside of the cartridge to the inside of the cartridge. So as we look, it actually goes cleaner from the outside to the inside. We're going to hose this entire thing off into our pretreatment tank. We're going to clean the outside of the filter and you can kind of tell it goes from the dingy color to a, a bright red color. We're also going to take time to clean between the rings. Now we've cleaned the filter well enough to, for it to be reinstalled in the tank. We're going to put the canister back over the outside of it. Okay, as a final service step, we're going to Rinse out the inside 
and we're going to reinstall our probe into the tank. We're going to tie up our wires using a zip tie for the probe to keep them out of the way. We've also reinstalled the filter using the wrench to tighten it up. If a sample is required for the system, we have a port attached to the outlet portion of the filter. You put the panel into the service mode too to force on the pump, and you take this. We're going to flush the line first, make sure any debris that would be caught up in that line uh, is purged through it. We're going to use that to, uh, to fill our sample jar. Sample will be filled according to uh, what's required for your local regulatory authority and for the proper uh, methods of preservation for the lab. We also obtained a sample in a clear bottle when we pulled our, our sample down here so we could check the effluent for uh, any color, turbidity, any visual uh, any observation or odor observation on it. Uh, having none, the system seems to be in proper order and proper working condition. We're going to want to make sure that we leave the control panel uh, with a green light on, that we reinstall the lids on top of the risers uh, and clean up any mess that we made, uh, leaving it looking like or better than when we got here. Uh, thank you for watching the video.